Hello, I am Edward, and this is my family, Christine, Matthias, and Sheldon. God has really blessed me, and I think you will see why as you watch this story behind my music. Wow, isn't that beautiful? Yes, it's not beautiful because I play it. It's beautiful because God has given us wonderful music. And not just music, God has given us wonderful gifts to praise his name. I had never dreamt in my life that one day I would stand in Cambridge, Ontario, Canada, harping around for fancy people like you. Our God is an awesome God, and I praise Him every single day that He chose me for this work, traveling around the world, praising His name with a smile on my face. If that wouldn't have been for people like you who supported mission work, I would never have made it to this country. God gave me the grace. He touched my heart as a little child in the Paraguayan jungle through Christian radio and later missionaries came and confirmed and told us white people, us as children and young people, that we should use our head, that we should go and study and praise the Lord. Here I am. Thank you so much for coming to this beautiful church tonight. I hope that the Holy Spirit will touch your heart, and I hope that you will be blessed. In 1927, the Canadian government changed the, the German uh, system in schools. They didn't let them have the, the German in school anymore. And our people thought it was quite important to have that. That was one of the reasons in 1927, 1,600 of my people moved away from Manitoba to isolate themselves literally from the modern civilization. And Paraguay was the country who let them in with that condition that they could practice their German stuff. And uh, they settled in an area which they called the Grand Chaco. 500 kilometers away from the nearest city they settled in an area where never a white person had lived before. 
My mom and dad were born and raised in Paraguay, and so were my five brothers and I. In very poor conditions for the first years of our lives, we had actually for many years just a grass roof over our heads. My mom and dad, their schooling was very, very poor, and ours was actually not much better. How about you never heard music in your church on a Sunday morning? Wouldn't that be a boring service? <laughs> Put yourself in my shoes. For many years of my life, we were not allowed to sing harmony. We were not allowed to play an instrument. And then finally, God sent wonderful people from this country to us. They came and told us that we could rejoice in the Lord, that we could use our gifts to praise God with all our heart. I will never forget those nights. I praise the Lord for those missionaries who left their beautiful homes behind in this country, and not just their homes, they left their wives and their children behind to come and tell us that we should repent, that we should serve the Lord with all our heart. Through the grace of God, today, my lovely mom and dad and all six of us brothers are born-again Christians serving the Lord from the bottom of our heart. I had never thought that something like that would happen for us. My ancestors moved away from Canada in 1927. 1,600 people packed their boxes in the province of Manitoba, Canada, 
and moved away from modern civilization. They couldn't have found a better place to isolate themselves from the modern world than the Paraguayan Chaco. 500 kilometers away from the nearest city, my ancestors settled in an area where never a white person had lived before. The Spanish people called the area the Green Hell, up to 51 Celsius in the summer. When those people came from Manitoba, they didn't know what hit them. <laughs> 500 kilometers away from the nearest city, they settled in an area among seven wild Indian tribes. They were bitterly poor. 126 people died at the first year settlement, including one of my great grandmas. She left all her little children behind and her husband, walked into the bush, and died on malaria. But my other great grandma also got that disease. She did the same, walked into the bush, and wait to die by herself. But God had mercy on her and healed her from that disease and made my great-grandma later the midwife of our colony, and she brought over 500 children to the world. Not her own, though. She helped other ones. <laughs> my great-grandma just passed away a few years ago. In Paraguay, she was 103 years old. Isn't our God an awesome God? I had never dreamt that God had something in store for me. Through the grace of God and His mercy, I made it to this country, and today I can serve God and share what Jesus has done for me. The next song I have, Are you washed in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? Are you free from the slavery of sin? Surely goodness and mercy God has given to us. He didn't give it just to the Baptist or to the Pentecostal or to the Mennonites. Praise the Lord that God sent His Son Jesus and let them die for the whole world's sin. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ, His personal Savior, is my brother and my sister in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Our God is just plain and awesome God. I praise Him every single day that He chose me for His child. But he also said to me, go and bring the gospel to the rest of the world. Go and tell your story how God has changed your life. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here before you tonight. I want to praise the Lord with that gift God has given to me. I remember my ancestors, especially my great-grandparents, told us stories about Canada. They told us that in Canada, the country they had left, people could ride trains, they could drive with cars, and they could fly with planes. I looked at many books and I saw pictures there I had never imagined one day to see. 
I remember the missionaries who came, one after another. I still remember one of the missionaries, he would dress nice. This guy even smelled good. <laughs> I think this was one of the first time I ever smelled perfume in my life. I remember this missionary. He told us young people that we should use our head and that we should go to the big city to study. We lived 500 kilometers away from the city. I had no idea what was behind that jungle out there. Many times I had wondered, why did I end up here? In 1980, as a 20-year-old boy, I said one evening to my mom and dad, I have made up my mind. I'm leaving the bush for the big city. Again, put yourself in my shoes. I remember coming to the city as a 20-year-old boy. I had no idea what hit me. A city full of pavement roads, lots of cars and electricity. I remember landing at the South American Theological Seminary. 20 years old, I could barely read and write. I had to learn the Spanish language. I had to find a job among the Spanish to pay my tuition. Many times I went to bed crying myself asleep. I remember the first time I walked in or at campus, I was looking all over the place for this famous outhouse. I couldn't find it nowhere. I thought, man alive, where does fancy people going for stuff like that? <laughs> Finally, one of the Spanish guys was so helpful, he came and said to me, Edward, follow me, I will show you where it is. He opened the door up and said, brother, that's our washroom. I looked into the room and I couldn't believe my eyes. There was six or seven thrones in a row. I think those were the most beautiful seats I had ever seen in my life. <laughs> I have no idea what to do with those beautiful seats, but this guy actually explained it to me, how the machine worked. <laughs> and then, praise the Lord, he left me alone. <laughs> Listen, brothers and sisters, today I can joke about it. At that time, I could have stood beside that machine and cried. I remember sitting among all the Spanish people in the music class at university level or at college level, and the teacher asked me one day and said, Edward, could you give me the middle C on the piano? I hadn't a clue what that guy was talking about. I had no idea what the middle C was on that machine. Praise the Lord. I walked down the aisle, lined one of the boxes up and hit the middle button, and if you believe it or not, I hit the middle C right there down. That was my biggest luck I ever had, my music ministry. <laughs> From there to the supermodern stage, my friend, I had never dreamt that God had something like that in store for me. I had never seen another church on my background. One Sunday morning, I walked into the Spanish city and we found a huge brown building packed full of Spanish people on a Sunday morning service. They were standing, they were clapping, they were smiling. Some of them were dancing down the aisle with their hands up. When I saw that, I said to my friend, hey, we better watch what we are doing. These people are all nuts in this house. <laughs> but soon I realized that those people had come to the church not to sleep like I had done it all my life. These people were actually excited to praise the Lord from the bottom of their heart. And here is one of the first songs I learned from them. I have decided to follow Jesus. <laughs>
This year alone, my wife and I and our two little boys, we were in Mexico. We were just about two months in the U.S. on tour. And we just came back from a, one of the best countries I have ever seen in my life. A 10-day tour in Jamaica. Yeah. And you know why I'm saying it? I have a bunch of Jamaican people here. Whoa, it is so wonderful to see. When I saw the first time in my life a black person, I couldn't believe. We were single at that time, my friend and I, and I remember, remember lining that lady up in the U.S. Customs in Miami, Florida in 1986. This woman, this black lady, spoke about 100 miles an hour. I couldn't understand. She said not a word. But when she handed me the passport over to me, and I thought, man alive, I better be nice to this lady. I knew one sentence in English, and I used it right there. Turned around to this black lady and said, yes, sir. <laughs> wow, you should have heard that lady after that. That was amazing. Brothers and sisters, I praise the Lord that God made us not all the same. He made us all absolutely beautiful. And I praise the Lord that he can use all of us. If you're black, yellow, green, or even gray, it doesn't matter. Our God is just plain and awesome God. He wants us on fire for Him, praising His name with a smile in our face. This harp, when I came to the big city to study music, this harp was not even in a program. I took it private. For six years, I learned to play the Paraguayan polka music style. In 1986, when I came to Canada, God called me into the ministry to play the old hymns to praise His name. I had never dreamt in my life that one day I would play this instrument. This harp is made by the native people in my country, Paraguay. This harp is the loudest harp in the world. I have 38 strings, and they're all from nylon. The strings are so close together that you cannot get your fingers in between. You actually have to hit it from the outside like a hammer. To play the harp, the Paraguayan harp, you need absolutely perfect fingernails for it. Whatever you hear is all done with the nails, with a few little exceptions. I have just a diatonic scale on this harp and not a chromatic. In other words, one key at once. That's it. On my right hand side, I usually play four fingers the melody and four fingers accompaniment with the left hand side. Together, it goes like this. Isn't that cute? <laughs> when I heard it first, and this is one of my most important stories, not the most important, but one of the most important stories I will tell tonight. As a little child, my mom and dad were so bitterly poor that we didn't know sometimes what to turn our head. Mom and dad loved us from the bottom of their heart. They did everything they could for their six boys to raise us in a little mud house. In our churches at that time, we were not allowed to sing harmony. We were not allowed to play an instrument. One day, my dad came home with a beautiful shiny box. My dad called that box a radio. In 1967, as a little seven-year-old boy, I heard the first time in my life the most beautiful noise a human being can hear on this earth. Music. And then a message in our own German language. And that message came to us from a Christian radio station, HCJB World Radio from Quito, Ecuador, the voice of the Andy Mountains of South America, and changed the whole family that night forever. Yeah, when, when I heard that, that beautiful radio box that night in 1967, I remember there's a whole family sitting around this box. You have to keep in mind, at that time in my church, we were not allowed to sing harmony. We were not allowed to have an instrument in a church. No instruments played in church. One day, my dad comes home with this beautiful shiny box. He was so excited. He said, you know what, guys? The 
This is a radio. Tonight we'll hear music. I had never heard my dad talk like that. He was so excited. I remember sitting that night. It was a beautiful night. Billions of stars above our head. No electricity, nowhere around. That night, when my dad turned his box to a certain direction, when he pulled that little knob over, there it was. The most beautiful noise we ever heard in our lives. Music. It was just amazing. And then when that music died off, somebody spoke in that box in our own German language. That night, seed was put into our little hearts. And that seed never died. It never died. Today, the work I am doing is the result of that mission work. Somebody who supported that Christian radio station. It came to us from 8CJB World Radio, from Quito, Ecuador, the voice of the Andy Mountains of South America, and changed the whole family that night forever. I remember asking my dad hundreds of questions. What in the world is in that box that it speaks? We had lots of fun with that, I tell you. My dad said, there are people sitting in it. We well, were just joking. But we as little children, we thought it was dead serious business. I remember laying behind that box later, looking into those little holes. We saw all kinds of little people standing there and talking loud. I had never dreamt in my life at that time that one day I would have the privilege to play through that Christian radio station in Quito, Ecuador. They have played my music for years. I have done today many, many fundraisers for HCJB World Radio. Through mission work, I heard the gospel, my mom and dad did, and many of my friends. For years we heard that radio station. It was, by the way, the only station we could hear in the first place. And then later, Missionaries came and confirmed what we heard. And those missionaries also told us, young people, that we should use our head, that we should go and study and use, uh, to go and study in the city and using our knowledge which God has given to us. Because of all of that, I would say through mission work and through the grace of God, I am there where I am today. And I cannot brag about myself. And I do not want to do that. I want to share what God has done in my life and that He has changed it through the grace of His. Today I have the privilege to be a blessing for thousands and thousands of people around the world. Our God is an awesome God. We, you and I, we can make no Christians. But God can do it with us if we just let Him do it. I want to play two songs now, solo with the harp, just to give you an idea what the harp is all about. This one has no background music. I will do a polka, and then I will do an old hymn, and then maybe another hymn on the end of that. Enjoy the beautiful sound of the Paraguayan folk harp.
1986, I left Paraguay with 42 Celsius and flew to the frozen north. Canadian passport in my hands. The first Canadian uh, English person I met was in Miami, Florida. The story I just told you. And from there, I flew to the city of Winterpack, Manitoba, Canada. <laughs> Excuse me, Winnipeg, Manitoba. <laughs> when I hit in that province minus 42 for two weeks, I knew exactly why my ancestors had moved away from this country. <laughs> it was too bitterly cold in that country. It was so cold, I didn't know where to turn my head. My dear brother and sister, I was maybe two weeks in a city. Somebody called me in my own German language and said, Brother, I heard that you played the harp. Would you come and play in my church? I said, Yes. He said, Listen, brother, we are quite conservative. Could you just play the old hymns, please? I thought, Wow, did I hear right? I thought those guys had all moved to the jungle. <laughs> but obviously, there were some left in Canada. I said, Listen, brother, no problem. I will come and play for you the old hymns. And I went. One song after another, I played for them. Nothing happened. I couldn't even get the people to smile. But finally, I hit the right song. I saw many smiles. They even clapped for that song. When I was done with the song, an older lady piped up and said, Listen, brother, that's a Canadian folk song. I couldn't believe my ears. Here's that beautiful song. De la misma iglesia tu eres. You are from the same church as I am. We have the same God together. Give me your hand. We are brothers and sisters. De la misma iglesia tu eres. For you people, the Red River Valley. A beautiful song. Some of our people must have loved it when they heard it in Canada. They smuggled it into the bush out there and gave it a different title. And here we are, praising it as a hymn in our churches. I thank God that he has given us the opportunity that we can travel today playing those beautiful songs people have left behind for us. I praise the Lord for my family that I can travel with them. Being on the road with the motorhome is, is, is a lot of fun, but it's not always easy. To travel every day from one concert to another, it's a challenge. But the good thing about it is that we can homeschool our children and we, have, we can have our family with us. Uh, we can make our home meals. We can stay right there at the church and, and travel to the next place, relax. And, and we can change right there. So there are many good things about it. And I praise the Lord that he has given us the opportunity to do it this way. Many years I traveled together with my brother. And maybe some of you even saw me 12 years ago traveling with him through Ontario. We traveled a lot in Europe. We had a lot of fun. We were both single and looking. <laughs> I remember one day we traveled in southern Ontario. I didn't live here at that time yet. But I remember in a big city in southern Ontario with the name Tavistock, 
You know where that city is? If you don't, don't look at the map. You might not find it. But anyways, in one of those churches that evening, my brother and I, we saw two blonde ladies sitting there. And one of those two is today my wife. I praise the Lord for giving me an absolutely beautiful Christian woman. I praise the Lord for giving me a wife who has all the qualities I never had before I was married. I praise the Lord for giving me and my wife beautiful two little boys. They are five and seven years old, Matthias and Sheldon. I praise God for giving us a ministry that we can travel together as a family going around and proclaiming what God has done for us. Without my family, I could never do it. I praise the Lord that he has given me the opportunity to travel and praising the Lord with joy around the world. I had never dreamt that God had something like that in store for me. From a little mud house in a Paraguayan jungle to that what you hear tonight, there are many tears behind. Many times I thought I wouldn't make it, and I would not have made it without God's help. I praise God that he never gave me a bigger load than I could carry. Our God is an awesome God. Through mission work, my dear brother and sister, and through the grace of God, I am standing here before you tonight with a smile on my face, together with my family, my wife and children, proclaiming God's name. The next two songs, in the sweet by and by, the second song at Calvary, where Jesus died for all of us. As a little child, my mom and dad had to work very hard for us. My dad was a blacksmith. He made buggies for many years of his life. My mom had to take care of six little boys. She had to sew the clothes for us with her hands. 
our roof above our head for many years was just the grass roof, mud walls, mud floors. I remember sleeping on dry grass, grass mattresses, full of cockroach and bloodsuckers. <laughs> Some of you people, I am sure, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it's amazing how God can change our life. And that's why I can never thank him enough that he chose me for this work. And I am here not tonight to brag about myself. I am here tonight to tell you how awesome God is, that he can change our life, and that he can use our gifts to praise his name. I remember as a little child, one day I saw the first time in my life a jumbo jet flying over the jungle with their long white tail behind them, the long line, and the little period in front of it. It was the biggest thunder I had ever heard in my life. <laughs> I remember running home and screaming and yelling at mom and dad. I said, guys, did you see what we saw? And they said, yes. I said, mom and dad, what was that? Yeah, how would my mom and dad know? But they said, we think it was a plane. People were flying from one country to another. I said, mom, the one we saw, there were no people in it. <laughs> I couldn't figure that people could fit in a little box like that. Now, I remember when I came to the big city to study music, one day I had the privilege to play at evangelistic evening with the Paraguayan harp. I was a student at that time. And I remember the evangelist who was there that night, he was from Germany. He saw me play the harp. And after that evangelistic evening, he handed me over a business card and said, Brother, I would like to do one day a concert tour with you in Germany. I thought, man alive, that's the biggest joke I ever heard in my life. I remember in 1985, just before Christmas, three jungle guys were sitting in a big jumbo jet, ready to take off at the International Airport in Asuncion, Paraguay. Just picture that a little bit. I will never forget it. I was sitting on that beautiful sofa in that plane. I thought to myself, this must be the plane I had shot at so many times with a slingshot. <laughs> Anyways, just before we took off already, we were in big trouble. There was a nice looking lady. We weren't looking yet, but this girl just was keep digging on us. She said, guys, buckle up. I had no idea what buckle up was. <laughs> but before we took off, I knew what buckling up was. <laughs> and I remember we flew to Germany. I was sitting on a window when we came through the clouds above Frankfurt in December. I just yelled at my friends. I said, guys, look, they have a white dirt in Germany. When touchdown came, the dust was flying all over the place. I thought, man alive, this is amazing, this stuff. We walked into the, plane, to the airport, and there about 50 young people picked us up, including the evangelist. They said to us, guys, you are lucky. We have a lot of snow outside. You should have seen us. We dropped everything and ran out those doors. For the first time in my life as a 25-year-old boy, I saw that miracle white stuff. I had dreamt of 25 years and thought to myself, what is that stuff all about? When I touched it, it was amazing. It was soft. It was cold. We put it in our mouth. We put it in our pocket. And you name it. <laughs> Listen, brothers and sisters. And then the evangelist put us in his BMW or Mercedes, whatever that was. It was an amazing car. I remember driving down the German autobahn. This guy, he was just flooring it. He went 180 kilometers an hour and had three jungle guys in the back seat. <laughs> Think about it. We were sitting at the back seat like this. <laughs> we just couldn't catch up with all the stuff flying by. It was just absolutely incredible. We went to his beautiful home, and I tell you, in that house, I saw more things I had ever seen in 20 years in the Paraguayan jungle. I remember the first concert, a couple days for preparation. This guy, he bought us all three a brand new suit. You should have seen it. It was the most beautiful suit I had ever worn in my life. And we went to a concert. Before the concert, there were about 4,500 people waiting for us in Bielefeld, Germany, at the concert hall. Put yourself in our shoes. While we're driving on this autobahn, I perhaps made the biggest mistake ever in the northern world. Before we were at the program, Maybe an hour before, still flying on the autobahn, I said to the evangelist, listen, brother, could you just pull over on the autobahn a little bit? We have to do some business before the concert in that bush there. You get it? What a shame on us. I had no idea 
what I had said wrong. But after the evangelist turned around to us and said, we have a place for something like that, I had no questions to ask anymore. I remember this guy pulled over at the rest area, parked his beautiful BMW in that beautiful parking lot, and sent three jungle guys into a German autobahn washroom. And think about this, once you were inside, we opened the door up, you couldn't believe all the buttons in that house. The Spanish guy went to the sink, and he said to me, Edward, come and look at what, the, what this is. There was, a, there was just a sink, and a pipe came out of the wall, but there was nothing to open it up. He said, how in the world are the German people getting the water out? I said, listen, brother, I have an idea. Let's look into the hole and see what's in there. <laughs> I will never forget how that water came flying out that <laughs> thing. The sky was wet from here to all the way down. The German people were standing in the washroom and watching us jungle guys. But praise the Lord, we didn't tell them where we were from. Listen, my friend, why I'm telling you this story, we take so many things for granted in our modern country. God has given us so much. And by the way, I want to say too, that today, through the grace of God, our Father in heaven, so many of my people in the Paraguay and Chaco and my colony have committed their life to Jesus Christ. They are loving the Lord and they are working in mission fields all over the place. My own people, MCC Canada, sent the missionaries to us and today our colonies are blooming because God is blessing it. It's awesome. 26 years. <laughs> Amen. 26 years ago, I learned to play my first song on a Paraguayan harp, The Little Brown Church in a Wildwood. And here is that song. In 1980, when I came to the city as a 20-year-old boy, I had heard the gospel many times. First of all, as a seven-year-old boy, my dad came home one day with a beautiful shiny box. He told us children that this box was a radio and that we would hear music. And that night in 1967, I heard the first time in my life beautiful music and then a message in our own German language. That night changed my life forever. We heard that radio box many times. And then later, missionaries came to us and they confirmed what we heard on the radio. In 1980, when I came to the city to study, I had an idea already what was out there, but I had never seen it, I had never experienced it. I thought when I came to the city that we, our background, was the only highway to heaven, how we were brought up. But when I came to the city, I saw that I was wrong. There were many people who thought the same as I did. There were many people who had committed their life to Jesus Christ.
as personal savior. I actually didn't know how that worked yet. I studied for many years there. When I came to the, and then in, in 1986, I finished up my music school and moved to Canada. From there, I traveled all over the world. I was the biggest hypocrite you could have found. I still thought that I was that good person. I still thought because of my background, I had it all made. In 1990, as a 30-year-old boy, I finally saw that I couldn't make myself a Christian, that only God could do that for me, and that had, God had done it a long time for me, just that I had finally had to believe that. In 1990, November 27, at 12.30, I came on the end of the big superhighway. I kneeled down beside my bed in the city of Winnipeg, Canada, and I said, Lord, I cannot play this hypocrite game anymore. I cannot make myself a good Christian, and, and I cannot even do it myself. I kneeled down, down beside my bed, opened up the Bible at John 3.16 till 21, and I started reading it, praying, and asking Jesus to come into my heart. After two hours of praying and crying and confessing my sins, Jesus came into my heart and made me a child of His. That day, God changed my whole life around forever. And that changed my attitude toward life. That I don't have to, that I don't have to judge my background anymore. Being upset what they have done and how I was raised at home. That I can forgive. That I can keep my life up on fire for the Lord. It doesn't help judging other people. It doesn't, doesn't help judging other background religious people. Each single person has to make a commitment with the Lord. And if you don't do that, the rest doesn't help you nothing. If you are Baptist, if you are Mennonites, if you are Presbyterians United, whatever church background you have, it doesn't matter. There is just one God up in heaven. He sent His Son Jesus and let Him die for all of us. If we believe in Him as personal Savior, we are brothers and sisters. And that's the only thing that counts. My last song I have is my most beautiful song I ever learned to play on a Paraguayan harp, Amazing Grace. Through grace we are saved, not through our works. And here's that song, Amazing Grace.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters. I hope this story behind my music was a blessing to you. As you can see on the video, from the jungles of South America to the super modern stage, how much God has blessed me. I hope it was an encouragement in your walk with the Lord. God bless.